Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Ken Coleman, the director of the Center for Political Studies at the Institute for Social Research. And I'm glad you could join us today in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Center for Political Studies. Our main feature is a talk by Arthur Lupia, which will begin in a few minutes. Let me say a few words about our center and also show a short video of tribute. CPFs was launched as a research center at ISR in 1970. The impetus for this new center was the success of the Michigan election studies and the additional political research they generated around the world. Warren Miller, for years the principal investigator of the Michigan election studies, was the first director of CPS. And of course, the Michigan election studies eventually became the American National Election Studies, the longest running academically based survey of public opinion and political behavior in the world. CPS quickly became much more than the location of the semi-annual election studies. Since its founding, it has continued its strength in public opinion and elections, but it has also been devoted to research on international relations, violence, media and politics, institutional effects on policies and individual behavior, political development, and public knowledge and public information. Before I introduce today's keynote speaker, we'll hear from CPS alumni and faculty in a short video. We have received messages from many people sharing their experiences with the center, and we aren't able to include them all here, but you can view all of them on the CPS website. So I'll turn it over to the video for a few moments. This is a really long-standing, really important institution that created the direction for the study of American politics, that Campbell, Converse, Miller, Stokes, establishing the American voter in that setting, um, set the direction for the field for decades. Congratulations uh, on keeping this up for this long, and uh, I hope uh, we'll see many, many more years of great scholarship to come. Um, the faculty are all crazy perfectionists, all of us. Uh, we don't peacefully delegate. And in an ordinary world, our perfectionism pulls in our reach and means that we only individually have 24 hours in a day. But with the amazing CPS staff, our crazy perfectionism is in good hands. That astonishing and professional and all in to make it happen staff means we really can dream bigger, build scientific infrastructures, and have tremendous reach. And Edmonton, I, I had access to the best that Michigan offers. The constant interchange of ideas, the intellectual excitement, the conversations on the hallway, the gatherings on the old lounge were unparalleled in my academic experience. I mean, office space as a student kind of connected to CPS with other other doctoral students was really essential. Um, it provided you with an opportunity to connect to your peers and some of those older peers who were really great mentors, helping you not just think about your classes, but kind of helping you solve methods questions, uh, helping direct you to, to opportunities or, or, or resources. Some of the items that we developed have become 
standard measures of political action. And clearly, this is something that we, we could not have been developed without Warren Miller and the Center for Political Studies. was hired as a research assistant to work on the American National Election Study. And it was just it was fantastic to go through and you know, sort of not just to see the instrumentation, how it's developed, but the names that were involved, you know, people who are grad students who went on to be professors. Uh, I remember that summer also I got to meet Warren Miller, who was visiting. Um, and just I felt a real connection to that the CPS community that I was, you know, sort of the, the next the next stage of the CPS family. I think that Warren would first say thank you and congratulations to everyone who's helped make CPS such a success over these 50 years. I think he would be gratified, he would be pleased that the work that he envisioned early on um, has been supported, not just by colleagues, but by staff, by administrators, by foundations, that that support has continued. And so um, CPS is just terrific and um, a lot of things I did would not have been possible had it not been for the center and the, both the support, uh, the administration, and the resources that it's provided. Of course, it's a wonderful set of colleagues. I value that very much. Happy 50th Happy birthday to the Center for Political Studies. Yes. Happy birthday. We were there at the beginning and real happy to still be involved. Very few people can say that they've worked at the um, ISR for 55 years, Michael. Probably. Very, very few people can say they've worked 55 years anywhere. But, but, it, but it's just been, it's just been a home sort of. Right. So um, there's a lot more content, a lot more full-length videos, and um, more uh, tributes, um, written tributes on the website. I, I encourage you to go there. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, um, Dr. Arthur Lupia. Um, I know him as Skip. Uh, he's assistant director of the National Science Foundation and serves as head of the National Science Foundation's social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate. At the U of M, he is the Gerald R. Ford Distinguished University Professor and a Research Professor at the Institute for Social Research in CPS. He also co-chairs the National Science and Technology Council Subcommittee on Open Science. Lupia's research examines factors that guide decision-making, trust, and learning in complex or adverse circumstances. His work is used to improve communication and quality of life in contexts around the world. Lupia has been a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and is a recipient of the National Academy of Sciences Award for Initiatives in Research. He earned a BA in Economics from the University of Rochester and a Social Science PhD at California Institute of Technology. Uh, at the end of uh, 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 Lupia's talk, we will take your questions. Uh, I invite you to send questions through the comments section on YouTube. You can send your questions in throughout the presentation and we'll do our best to answer them all before the time ends on, our, uh, on the overall event. Note that live captioning of this event is available. 
Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, enjoy the presentation, and I'll turn it over to Skip now. Uh, thank you so much, Ken, and thank you to everyone uh, at CPS and who's associated with CPS uh, for the amazing work that you've done. Um, what I want to talk about today reflects a little bit on uh, CPS's contributions and talks about how people at CPS and so many other people around the world are building on the amazing things that have happened at CPS. Um, but I want to start with a couple of priorities. Uh, it is 2020 and it's been a tough year on everyone. So as we think about uh, how to serve one another, how to be more effective, how to take the amazing opportunities that we have and provide the best, the, the most service, the most meaningful service that we can provide to others, just want to uh, wish you well, uh, wish you health for your families and your communities. Uh, these are the key priorities today. And two themes that orient my thinking about this moment that we have, both when we're outside the university and inside, uh, one is gratitude uh, for all the things that I know each of you are doing uh, to help yourselves, to help your students, to help your families, to help others who are in need, to help people who we can't always see uh, get through this time. Uh, so gratitude, I hope that is reflective in, in all that I say because uh, I know what a lot of you are doing and all of it matters. We will need everyone uh, to get through this time, and we will. And the other thing is love. You don't uh, always hear that talked about in an academic seminar, but to manage our current situation, we need to love one another as much as we can whenever possible, and even a little more than we think we can uh, when it is needed. Uh, so, so that's how I'm beginning an orientation today to this challenge. Uh, and CPS. Uh, what an amazing place. Um, as you know, uh, it was started by Warren Miller. Uh, Warren Miller did so many really amazing things, uh, but there are three things that he started that are, are really worth talking about and all integrated into CPS. Of course, there's the ANES, there's ICPSR, and there's CPS. With the American National Election Studies, uh, as John Krosnick said in the video, um, it has really transformed how this country understands itself <clears throat> through the commitments that he and Phil Converse and, and people throughout the decades have made in terms of measurement, in terms of the questions that are asked, in terms of the care and the rigor of, the, of analysis. Uh, the ANES has informed both uh, poll, uh, academic surveys in this country, commercial polling, and inquiries about elections and other topics around the world. Uh, so it's really important today to understand things like you see on the screen here. Uh, that's the 2016 election. It's by county. Uh, the red counties are counties that voted for President Trump. The blue counties are counties that voted for uh, Secretary Clinton. And the height is how many people live in them. Uh, the National Election Studies has really helped scholars and the country understand why that's happening and what it means for the future. And then there's ICPSR. Now, historically, ICPSR existed before CPS, but when CPS was founded, ICPSR was part of it. And under in its time at CPS, ICPSR really flourished. So again, ICPSR, if, if, I, I think everybody knows, but if you don't know, it, it was a mechanism, an institution that Warren and others set up to really help share data, first from the ANES, uh, but then from other studies. Uh, ICPSR was a subunit of CPS from 1970, its founding to 1998. And in those 28 years, there was a tenfold increase in the revenue that it generated. And why does the revenue matter? Because of the services it provided, it showed just how valuable what ICPSR was doing and, and does today. It doubled the staff. And here's a key metric I found when looking at the historical record. Uh, during these CPS years, uh, ICPSR went from distributing 28 million index cards to scholars to 3.8 billion. That's when they stopped counting in 1988. So we don't think of you know, high-end analytics as being a huge part of previous decades, although that, that you know, we can look at the historical record. But this shows you, these numbers show you just how central CPS was and ICSR was, ICPSR was to distributing critical data all over the country. Uh, but but CPS is so, you know, ANES is great, ICPSR is great, but there's so much more to CPS. Um, 
there are studies, rigorous studies uh, to give us data and understanding about politics and society around the world. Here's Professor Engelhart, who you saw in the video again, and the way that he has helped us think about how individuals and societies adapt to historical challenges, right? Uh, uh, evolve over time. Again, it's changed not just scholarship, but the way that governments think about themselves, the way that societies organize themselves. And CPS is the home for that. But it's not just the past. In the present, CPS scholars are doing so much to help us with the issues of our day. These are just two recent seminars. You can see uh, some of the great people at ICPSR. They're both amazingly smart and they all photograph well. So that's a plus. Uh, but CPS is just, it, it's just this incredible place where so much scholarship has originated and CPS has done so much for the world. So, so that's the good news. But now I want to talk about a challenge that we face. Um, it's not been an easy time really for anybody. Uh, but some people, mostly people that are, are sometimes hard to see when you, you know, we're, we're on Zoom, it's been especially hard for them. 2020 has really challenged us. Uh, there's a pandemic. Uh, for every family that's been affected, for every life that has been lost, it's a tragic thing, right? And the scale of this is just hard to imagine, right? And we're all dealing with it, uh, some more than others. But this is a collective experience that we're having. Uh, and, and it is setting the tone for, for other things. Uh, beyond health, right, which is, you know, uh, the most important thing, uh, it's really disrupted the economy. So many people who had invested in their lives in certain careers or businesses have found that the opportunities they thought they had are no longer there and are wondering what to do next. And in education right? Uh, so many of you are now, you didn't think you were going to have two jobs being a school teacher at home and uh, doing the great work that you do for the universities that you work at in research. Uh, but now education is changing. And of course, the other thing that this uh, pandemic has done has revealed some things about societies to ourselves, about great injustices, about great inequalities. And we've seen in our country uh, what this, you know, how this is manifest. But what you don't see, at least in the U.S. news a lot, is there are effects like this all over the world. So 2020 has been a tough time so far. It has really challenged us. It has challenged our bodies with a pathogen. It has challenged our minds by disrupting our society. And it has challenged truth. So much of the challenges that we have today are about what counts as truth and what can we believe. So a question to ask when we think about 2020 is, are we up to this challenge? So I want to give a little bit of an answer to that. All over the world, there are people who are taking the opportunities that they have and trying to find ways to help others, right? Whether it's in their family or in their community or for people who are far away none of it is breaking news. Like breaking news is dedicated to people who break stuff largely. Uh, but there are people that resilience and the human spirit, if you look for it, you will see it all over the world. People doing incredible things, making incredible sacrifices to try and improve quality of life for others. One thing that we really need in 2020 is clarity. Clarity about how we can serve one another how we can take care of ourselves and how we can think about the social institutions that we have built and need to build and how to make them better. And so at this moment, there are real challenges, but as we think about a post pandemic society and there will be one, right? There are opportunities for us to build one that is better in many ways than the one that we had before. So there are so many people doing incredible things. And we should take a moment just to, to reflect on that because sometimes the news is bad and we can forget. But now what I wanna do is focus on one group of people. It's a pretty small group, but the work that they are doing uh, to help us through things like 2020 is really extraordinary. But they're not a new group. They're a group of people who have been helping us solve important problems for many decades. And that group is you. It's social scientists, right? Social scientists, do incredible things. 
They produce groundbreaking research on so many topics. They create fundamental data and analytic infrastructure, stuff that helps not only us, you know, with the inquiries we have, but we can make it available so that other people can try and figure out what's going on in, in domains about which they care or have great expertise. We also provide essential training. I mean, obviously in graduate programs and undergraduates, and that's key, but so much of what we produce infiltrates both through other types of schooling, whether it's business schools or community colleges, or the, the ideas like implicit bias, right, that are discovered in social science, but permeate out into society uh, and create great, uh, greater awareness for us and opportunities to do better. But underneath the social scientists are some core principles that we have that make the work that we do so meaningful, that give it such potential uh, to help other folks. The set of core principles that I think about when I look at social science, when I look at the work of CPS and all the people who are touched by it or influenced by it or doing similar work is rigor. And by rigor, I don't mean necessarily something you can count. I mean, the ability to explain how we know what we know. In an era of misinformation and, and fake news, it can be really important if you're going to say something that is controversial or complicated to be able to say, I know you might not agree with it, but here's how I came to this conclusion. Here's how I collected data. Here's how I did the analysis and so forth. Rigor is critical, as are ethics, right? Um, one of the things I love about the social sciences is we focus on people. Our, our work is based around people. And most of the conversations I've had the, the privilege of being associated with in my career, um, people do the work because they care about others, right? We are not like Facebook where you build it first and worry about people later. No offense, but you know, there it is. Uh, in the social sciences, there's a real concern about problems, about challenges and the people that we serve. And, and I'm really proud of that in, in terms of the work that you do. Precision in measurement and conceptualization, that's a key, right? We, we can't always be precise as we want to be, but we're always striving with the idea that greater precision and conceptualization in measure in measurement and conceptualization where we can achieve it uh, can help us say things that are more actionable more useful and more tied to quality of life and then causality now i think compared to most of the sciences and i love all of science we're actually pretty good at this and getting a lot better in part because of really challenging questions that have been asked by people at cps over a number of decades and causality really matters like correlation is fine, but if we're trying to figure out how to help a society solve a problem, uh, understanding a causal relationship, if it's there, can be the difference between doing something for someone and doing it to them, right? So the social sciences, I think, are, are a leading light in so many of these areas, and it allows social science as a whole to do amazing things. I think of science as service. There's both the service that we provide to the people we can see students. There's service we provide, example to, for example, to health professionals. If you think about things that have come out of, you know, our political science or economics or sociology or, or the other disciplines that can help inform uh, how to approach patients, how to structure a hospital, uh, how to deal with uh, civil unrest, right? Uh, there are all, all these things. So, you know, in this moment, uh, the impact on social, of social science on our ability to respond to a pandemic is powerful. But there's also science as a basis of innovation. Uh, there are so many people who want to solve problems, who want to build a better tomorrow. And uh, the social science, like the things that we do, often give people the insight and the leverage to think about how can we be better tomorrow than we were today. We have in social science the capacity to empower people to build the leaders of tomorrow. And it's an incredible thing. And that's something that you've done. It's something that CPS has done. It's something that social scientists around the world have done. And so when you take the global view of social science, there's some positive news. There is a worldwide impact. It's just unbelievable. I, I, as Ken mentioned, I've been spent a lot of time uh, at NSF and in Washington over the last couple of years, and you see it. It's just unbelievable how much of an impact, a positive impact the social sciences are having. Uh, it is increasingly rigorous in terms of our ability to explain what we know. And again, this is rigor in my view, qualitative, quantitative, that's, that's orthogonal to the issue of rigor. 
anyone has the ability if they take the time and they, they, they understand the method, right, to explain how they know what they know. And it's increasingly diverse, which gives us more worldviews and more perspectives. Are we where we need to be? No, uh, but we are making progress on it. The other thing about social science today is it's increasingly, increasingly integrated and networked into science and society. Uh, there are so many ways that we're getting out of the ivory tower and uh, trying to help people build better understandings and better solutions. Let me give you one example that just, you know, since I'm at NSF, I, I, I know about this, but this is, a, this is one of so many things that social scientists have done to help with COVID in ways that both advance scientific knowledge, but are helpful right now. So this example comes from the state of West Bengal. It's a state in India. You can see it uh, on the map. And it's about a study that was run in the second quarter of 2020. NSF funded uh, it as did uh, some other organizations. Now, a couple things to know about West Bengal. The population is 91 million, the population of that state. And about, si about 60 million uh, have cell phones. Okay, that's gonna be important for the design of the study. Um, this population was being bombarded with messages about COVID, uh, you know, uh, behaviors you could pursue to slow the spread. Uh, some surveys run before the, uh, at this time estimated that people were getting about 20 messages per day about COVID. And yet there was suboptimal compliance with even basic requests about distancing and hand washing and, and maybe even reporting symptoms as soon as you see them. So a number of scholars asked a question that, that we would all ask, right, which is what attributes of a simple message most improve compliance? And so a group of researchers from a, a large number of universities actually uh, ran a study. Now, what, what's key here, if you look at the first author, that's Abhijit Banerjee. And so let me tell you something about him. Some of you already know who he is. Um, Abhijit Banerjee in 2019 was one of the Nobel Prize winners in economics, okay? Turns out he's also a native of West Bengal. And by virtue of being a famous economist and a Nobel Prize winner, he's a celebrity. So uh, what the team did was they made eight videos with uh, Abhijit Banerjee in them. The videos were all very similar, but, but they had a few variations in them. So he'd say mostly the same thing, but there'd be a sentence or two that was put into one and left out of others. And there were eight different versions made. They then took one of these eight videos and embedded them in cell phone messages that were blasted out to 25 million people in West Bengal, okay? Now you need cooperation from different organizations to do this, but they actually did this, okay? And the way that the randomization was done is uh, West Bengal has about 1400 zip codes and the randomization was to a zip code. So you'd randomly select the zip code and then everyone in that zip code would get the same message. Whereas everyone in a different zip code would get probably a different message because they were, it, so the randomization was on the zip codes. 25 million people got those messages. 3 million got a control message that just gave a link uh, to, a, to a health organization you could contact. That sentence was also in on all of the treatments. Okay, so PIN codes are the zip codes in India. They then collected data from 677 local health workers and 1,883 council members. These are, are, are people who uh, have certain offices uh, in that area to collect information about health behaviors, uh, and reports of cases, deaths, and so forth uh, in, in, throughout West Bengal. So that gives the data on uh, what was happening uh, in all of the PIN codes. Uh, the variations in the message, so it's an experiment. Uh, Three million got this just control message, a link to a government website. The treatments were uh, some of the videos focused on washing your hands. Others said avoid going to crowded places, distancing. Uh, others varied motivations. Some said you're going to protect the elderly and otherwise vulnerable people. Some messages did not have that statement at all. And the other variation was ostracism. Um, no one has the right to ostracize you for having the disease. Some messages said that, some didn't. So you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but there are two different treatments in that. But there, you know, there are two, you can see two different things in action, two different things in motivation two different things in ostracism, two by two by two. That's where the eight uh, versions of the video come from. And I wanna show you what they found. One 2.5 minute message, this is now looking at the behavioral data later on, corresponded to a doubling of the reporting of health symptoms to community health workers. It is in places where you got these messages, you saw a doubling 
in, in symptoms. There are the significance tests if you want, uh, comparing the groups, uh, the p-values are quite low, as you might expect, you know, given the numbers. Uh, decreased travel beyond one's village, which was the request in the video, um, that in the control groups, 37% uh, of the health uh, the, of the people who are interviewed later. And the people who are interviewed later may or may not have gotten the message. So again, the unit of analysis here is the PIN code. In PIN codes where you got a control message, 37% reported uh, traveling beyond the village. Where they got treatments, 30% reported it. Similarly with uh, estimated hand washing, an increase between the control group PIN codes and the treatment PIN groups of approximately 7.5%. It, this also, the difference also spilled over to some non-mentioned behaviors. Mask wearing was never mentioned, but was also different between the randomly selected pin codes. Again, these are like zip codes. Uh, and this was even true for people who hadn't been sent the message. Um, so again, we can talk about causality, although with the numbers here, uh, the differences are a little hard to explain it as being uh, by random. So this is an incredible possibility because you know, if you can get these effects, remember there are 91 million people in this province, right? In, in this state. So a 7% increase is millions of people, right? Uh, the, NSF, the, the amount of N that NSF spent on this was $200,000. And the videos themselves are not that expensive to produce. Imagine if we learn about things like this, the amazing things that can be done to improve messaging. There's so many examples I, I see at NSF like this. If you want to talk about them in the Q&A, we could be here for hours. And some of you I know are doing them too. It's an incredible thing, our shared endeavor, right? Our shared endeavor, which is producing rigorous and precise research that if we hit it right, can empower people and improve quality of life. So social science today is doing amazing things, but there's a challenge. There's one other thing that we have to be honest about. And that honesty, again, comes from the fact that we're in 2020. And when people see experts, particularly experts in the social sciences, where you know people believe they already know how the economy works, or they already know how elections work, or how psychology works, why do I need an expert like you? Particularly when you talk about uncertainty and your explanations are complicated. Many of you have encountered these questions asked in different ways. Why should we pay for what you do? There are people online on the internet who tell me everything I need to know. And why should we trust you? Because you're a bunch of professors and maybe you don't share my values. And so these are questions being asked, not just in the US, but those of you who study other countries, these questions are being asked of experts all over the world. So we in social science, to continue to be relevant, to continue to be people who, uh, you know, institutions and societies and vulnerable people look to, uh, to help improve quality of life, there's a couple adaptations that we have to make, right? Not about the science, but about how we engage. So I want to just talk about three of them, ways for us to improve the public value of what we do. One is greater transparency. One is better communication. And the other is greater engagement. Well, let's just go through each of those. In terms of greater transparency, we are in a situation now where for most of the, many of the things that we study, there are tons of people who claim to be experts. And some of them have very nice web pages and some of them are very good at tweets. But being good at making a web page and being good at tweeting is not the same as providing reliable information, right? Now, in the social sciences, we, we have the ability to do this, but because of publication pressures, because of publication biases, um, professional incentives to p-hack, that is to only uh, show or publish the estimations that we, pr that we find that produce positive results, or results that were aligned with the theory we had before, those individually and collectively undermine the cultural authority of the social sciences and pose a threat. And so as we think about why we ought to commit to greater transparency, that is you know, sharing our data where we can, where it's ethically sound to do so, sharing our code, sharing our code books, sharing you know, how it is we chose cases or, or, or things where it is ethically sound to do so. Um, there's a real reason to do it. And it's to understand our competition in the knowledge space. And I'm not gonna talk about people who peddle fake news, although that, right, um, there's that too. And we'll get to that when talking about communication. I'm talking about the various ways that you can know something. There are four ways to defend a knowledge claim. And I just want to walk through them to understand maybe what we need to do as social scientists. 
So one way you can claim to know something, to know that by no, no, I mean that a phenomenon does or doesn't fit in a category. So I might know that the Dodgers won the World Series, which means that I, I claim to know that the thing called the Los Angeles Dodgers fits into the category of won the World Series. Okay. So one way to defend a knowledge claim is to appeal to metaphysics. You can say there are forces beyond our ability to perceive or understand completely that determine what is true and false and what is right and wrong. And appeals to metaphysics historically ha have been very powerful and in the domain of ethics have, have you know, ha had uh, some good effects uh, as well as some, some really bad ones. But appeals to metaphysics are a common way of knowing, right? And, and, and we have to understand that we are in conversations where appeals to metaphysics are made. Another way to defend a knowledge claim is, is by personal testimony. That is to say, uh, I experienced something, I felt something, and this was my truth. This was true to me. And so one of the great things about having conversations or, or increasing diversity is you get to hear a little bit about the ways that people see things. So your truth might not be the same as my truth when it comes to experiences that we've had, but we can learn things from each other's truths, right? So personal testimony really matters. Then you can think about culture which again, to try and talk about the whole set of ways that you can defend a knowledge claim, it's everything between a field appeals to metaphysics and uh, your own uh, testimony between uh, you know, the individual and the metaphysical. And so we can talk about art and literature and, 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 and culture, uh, which take elements of the past, um, present them in a certain way and provide them as a means of lessons for the present and future. It is a way we claim to know. We can look at paintings. We can look at the way a building was built. We can look at literature and say, because it was presented this way, here is a lesson for us now, which reveals a certain truth. So we have metaphysics, testimony, and culture. There's one other way uh, that we can think about things, and that's science. And the way I like to explain what scientists do is suppose I have an object in my hand, it has a big red button here, it has a green light here. And when I press the red button, the green light goes on. And someone can ask me, they say, well, that's really interesting. What happens if I press it? And I can say, well, well, I use the scientific method to build and evaluate this object. And what I can tell you about it is that regardless of your metaphysical beliefs, um, regardless of some experiences that you've had, and regardless of the cultural experiences you have had, if you press this button, the light will turn green for you. It's the notion of intersubjectivity. And at the end, that's, one, that's something that we can do in science. That's something we can do in social science, where the claim, the validity of the claims that we make are not independent of culture or people or metaphysics, but they are less reliant on those forces as a basis for other people to take our claims and believe them as true, or at least legitimate and credible. To the extent that we can be transparent and stay away from publication bias and p-hacking and, and things of that nature, that gives people a, a reason to believe in our intersubjectivity and that with, even if they don't agree with what we're saying, that maybe they want to think about it a little more because it might help them reconcile their, their actions and their aspirations. The second part is better communication. I love us. I, I admire CPS, my colleagues. Uh, you know, so many of you, I think, that are watching that, that I know for, who have an uh, um, attachment to social science or CPS, I have such admiration for what you do. Um, it's difficult. Uh, it's hard to explain to your relatives at the holidays, but it is critically important. That said, we, like other scientists, most of us were never trained to talk about our professional work uh, with people unlike ourselves. And so for uh, members of the general public, uh, for policymakers, they often think that we talk at them rather than to them, rather than with them. So in terms of better communication, we could do a whole long talk about that. But what I want to do is, is ask us to think about co-production. If you closed your eyes for a minute and you thought about a song that you like, I could tell you something about the song that you're listening to. You know, maybe if I knew your age and things like that, I could tell you about the genre. And if it was in the pop music vernacular, I could tell you that probably half the lyrics are wrong. Another subject. But the thing that I, I do know about what you're hearing is that the arrangement is probably not exactly what's on the iPad, the, you know, the, your, your MP3 or wherever, the cloud, wherever you have it. Uh, 
Uh, the, the arrangement's probably a little different. Maybe a couple of the instruments are missing. But the other thing I know about that version of the song that you can hear if you close your eyes is you co-produced it. You paid such attention to the melodies and the rhythms and the silence that you're able to reproduce your own version and it gives you joy. The reason that matters for us is one thing that we know about learning in part thanks to work of social scientists and neuroscientists is I can't teach you anything and you can't teach anyone else anything either. All we can do is make variations in sound and light. To the extent that anything is learned, it's because the variations in sound and light that we make are so motivating to someone else that they pay attention to them. They work them into their own conceptual frameworks. And all the interesting, almost everything that's interesting in a learning act happens between the ears and slightly above of the people that we're speaking to, right? Co-production is critical to learning, right? And so in the social sciences, we have this amazing opportunity to serve people, but to serve them more effectively in an era where people question our value, it's really important to listen. It's really important to understand the journey that the people we're trying to help are on. Where are they trying to get? What is essential to them? If we can understand that journey, if we can take a moment to validate that journey and then use our science to help them take the next step, they are much more likely to co-produce with us the lessons that we are trying to convey. None of us are trained to do this. We're trained to go to conferences and write journal articles, and those are really important things. But our ability to increase the public value of what we do requires us, maybe not all of us, but more of us to learn how to speak with people, to speak uh, from the heart while retaining the rigor, as opposed to you know saying things that they can't hear. Not because they're not smart, but because we don't convey it in a way that, that they can co-produce. Finally, I wanna talk about greater engagement and I wanna make a proposal. Um, so I'm at NSF and what I'm saying now is not an NSF policy, although it is something that I, I, I'm just personally pursuing, okay? Um, at NSF, if you send a proposal, there are two criteria. There's intellectual merit and broader impacts. And I want to talk about broader impacts a as a way of engaging. I think that all of us in social science, if we have the opportunity to do so, should be prepared to explain the, the, broad, the public value of our work in three steps. There ought to be three things we can say about anything we're working on, even if it's really obscure and abstract applied research, uh, basic research. So the first thing is we want what we want to be able to do if somebody say like, why should I pay for your research? We ought to be able to describe the scientific opportunities and the research products that your research can create, the communicative products, sorry, that your research can create. So the scientific opportunities are things for grad students, things for other scholars, so forth. So if you make data, you share things. The communicative products are papers and videos and conferences and so forth. So we're used to talking about these things. We are used to, you know, these, when we do research, uh, this is what you get, uh, great things for students, uh, publications, and, and some communicative products. Sometimes we stop there, and if you want to stop there, that's okay. But I think that the public value of, of the social sciences can be a lot higher if more of us commit to taking a second step. And that second step is, if you think of the communicative products that we make, so I know communicative product is a weird word, but I'm talking about your articles and your books and even the blog posts and the Twitter and the videos and the websites and whatever it is you do, uh, the, you know, the, the, the community projects that you build. Describe who the communicative products can, can empower. And just as a friend, if possible, uh, let's have the answer not be policymakers because that's too nonspecific. Um, tell us who. Who is the policymaker? Who is the person in a position to help a community? And the reason I ask for that slight tick on precision is it will help us give them information that they need. Uh, in my position at NSF, I meet a lot of people in the policymaker space, and a lot of them love us, but they're kind of frustrated because um, we sometimes write for policymakers, but the policymaker is nondescript. We we kind of hope somebody down the line will figure out how to translate it and. Again, I, I, if, you, if you do basic research, great. But I think if more of us are at least connected to workflows or connected to chains, where we're, we're a little more knowledgeable about what people need from us, we can do amazing research that has a bigger impact. Not everyone has to do this, right? So that's, you know, some people we need to be in the lab 24 hours a day because that's their awesome, that's, that's their essential. Uh, but I think we need more people who can speak to that and, and do translation. But if you're asking me, I don't want us to stop there. 
I want us to be able to tell the story that if we empower this particular person or people with our work, here's whose quality of life we can improve. Because for me, the dependent variable I care about more than any other is quality of life. Everything else is a means to that. So I think that this three, this is my opinion. I think that this three-step process, if the more of us could say this in an elevator pitch, we're prepared to answer the questions. I think that would be great. And if you're cringing right now, you're like, I'm not asking for probabilities. I'm asking for possibilities, right? To just think about what impact your work could have. We know if you're doing basic research, like you're not going to know the probability. That's great. But if you if you have a sense of the link between your efforts and how they can improve other people's quality of life, it makes it easier for the Center for Political Studies, the Institute for Social Research, the University of Michigan, NSF, anybody else who you ask for money to make appeals themselves for more opportunities for you. Uh, if we can do those things, we have this amazing opportunity because every day, every single day, we have opportunities to conduct incredible research, legitimate research that imp empowers people in it and improves quality of life. And there's so much of that happening at CPS now. I, uh, my first uh, job in social science, the first time I actually got money was doing like redistricting stuff. And so I'm like a little bit of a geek on that. And I've been following Joey Chen's work. And Joey Chen is like, so I've read his work where he, he goes through and he, there's such precision in what he does in terms of talking about how different districting plans would, would have various impacts. And I've read the cross-examination where they appear to cross-examine him for days. And they just, it's like, it's like an action film where they come at him for hundreds of pages. And he knows what he's talking about. He knows the cases. He doesn't fudge stuff. He actually knows the, the, the context of the cases he's studying. So they ask about, what about District 16 in this part of South Carolina or North Carolina? Like, and he knows it. It's an incredible thing to see. To me, he's like the Jack Bauer of political methodologists. When you look like he just defeats all of his enemies. Like I wouldn't want to mess with that guy in that context. But what he does, in my view, is such a credit to the methods of the social sciences. I mean, just that the rigor and the clarity that he offers is an incredible thing. Walter Mebbin. I mean, you know, we're having a lot of conversations now about the legitimacy of elections. Walter has done incredible work with, with real, both in, in complex ways, but in ways that offer such clarity about how you can identify fraud in elections. Uh, and even when people are, are trying to be somewhat sophisticated about how to do it, uh, that's such important work right now. There's Christian Davenport. A Christian like does so many amazing things, uh, but a lot of it is about violence, whether it comes from the state or is happening in a place. And that's so important to understand its origins and its evolution because you want to find effective ways to stop it but to, or to try and mitigate it, uh, to try and improve quality of life. But you have to look it in the face and understand it first. And Christian does, does this in so many different ways, um, so rigorously, so tenaciously, it's incredible, and, and and the effect that it has on the ability to act is incredible. And I think Christian's work has done so much for so many people, including people we it's hard for us to see. Uh, there's Mara Ostfeld. Uh, her work is she's one of the younger people at CPS. Uh, she's doing this work on how we understand ourselves and, and how we understand others, and taking things that you might think are quite subtle, like the shade of your uh, of your skin tone, and and identifying not only how that affects how we see one another, but life outcomes. And again, that's not the most comfortable thing to talk about, but you have to look that type of thing in the face and understand it. If you wanna try it, if you wanna recognize the depth to which we have challenges in our society and do constructive things to, to make progress, to try and make people's lives better. And in all of these scholars and really everyone at CPS, and of course, you know, our friends who are watching this video who aren't at CPS, this is what you guys are about. Right? You guys are such a credit to this nation. You guys are such an asset to the world. And I know that you know a lot of times you have to explain social science and it sounds like, please know that individually and in the aggregate, what you do for students, what you do for your communities is so important. It is a way of showing gratitude for the amazing opportunity. If you're on this call, I assume you weren't randomly selected. We've had amazing opportunities to, to get to the position we are where we can have a conversation like this. And I think the rigor of the work that we do is a way of showing gratitude toward that. I think the rigor you know, and, and the ethics are a way to show gratitude and quite frankly, a way to show love for, for people that you can see 
and people that you can't see. And we have in front of us amazing opportunities in the social sciences. We have an ability to empower people. And in the limit, we can empower people all around the world to have better opportunities by explaining the human condition, by helping people understand it. Anyone who wants to create a new way of doing things, right? We have the ability to show them how to grow better solutions for, for communities. And most importantly, you know, leading a fulfilling and a meaningful life in a complex world is a, is a gift, uh, but it's something you have to, to fight for. And in the social sciences, because of what we study, because of the breadth of it, we have the capacity to help people do this. And no one else, you know, there's a lot of people working to improve quality of life, and we need to cherish every one of them. But there are things that we can do that no one else can do, and we need to do it, right? So with that in mind, I want to thank you for your service to science and to society, uh, because now more than ever, uh, what we do and how we do it is needed. Uh, so with that, I will thank you, and uh, we hopefully we have some time for questions. Thanks, Skip. Um, so um, thanks to this uh, for the in-depth look. Um, thanks to everybody for joining. Um, we now have time for uh, questions. Uh, the first one is from someone that you 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 uh, gave a shout out to Walter Mebbin. <laughs> and of course, you know the nature of his question. Yeah. You absolutely know it, right? Given the large number treated in Bengal study, the 25 million, even if one view would be, one could even view it that there's really just an N of nine, but he's gonna leave that aside. Yeah. Do the large p-values for the effect shown undermine believing that the estimated effects are actually real? Yeah. <laughs> That's always a legitimate question. And so, you know, I think that the, this is a view that I have, and I don't want to speak for the scholars, but I think that the the, I, I, the real end here is, I think it's like 1250, because that's the number of zip codes uh, where there was enough cell access to, to, throw, to throw them. And that's where you're getting some of the comparison across. And it's just like, you know, there was the randomization, I don't think you can question across the 1200 pin codes. So then it's like, well, why would you have a 7% increase? Now, do I think it's a direct effect of the text message? No. Um, but the question is, you know, could it be that when you have Banerjee uh, on a cell phone, you know, giving a, a message and you haven't seen, you know, Banerjee is a big deal, but you haven't seen him before and he hasn't really sent a text to you or he's looking right at you and asking you to wash your hands and, and be good to the elderly. I mean, so I think it's possible. But they are, they're very careful. They're trying to run other studies. And the one thing I will tell you is there are big differences between the control groups and the treatment groups. Between the treatment groups, the difference the differences aren't as aren't as good. I mean, they're they're not they're not as as big. And so they're running other studies in multiple countries to try and figure this out. Um, I know that a lot of people on this call uh, have done studies like that. Uh, I've actually encouraged some of the folks involved in that to to touch base, but. Um, I just, the scale of it, I mean, that you could, you know, uh, that you get a 7% difference in a state of 91 million people is, you, know, you just got to contemplate it for a while. But Walter, I think you're asking the right questions. Okay, we have an, another set of questions about p-hacking and um, there, uh, the question, they, 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 there's several questions and I'll just kind of put them together. Um, how big of a problem is this in the social sciences, perhaps relative to other sciences? And what can we do about them? And even asking if science is um, fundamentally uh, kind of like a courtroom in that you know you you do end up having people cheerleading for their own theories on various sides of a question. Um, you know, is p-hacking as big a problem as we think it is? So that's kind of a the, okay. several questions coming at it in, in different ways. That's Those are really good questions. So let me start with one point to make really clear. So it's not a bigger problem in social science than it is in a lot of other problems. To the contrary, I think that in terms of what is being done about it, what questions are being asked, what institutions are being built, we're actually way ahead. When we, so I'm co-chair of the 
the federal government's committee on open science where we integrate the agencies. And I can't tell you how many times ICPSR as a data sharing mechanism, as a mechanism for providing this kind of information that you'd, you'd want for kind of greater transparency. I can't tell you how many times ICPSR is brought up as the model. So I, I reject the idea that it's worse in the social sciences. Um, is it a problem? Um, I actually don't mind P hacking is a let me say it this way P hacking is a problem if you do it and you don't reveal it. So the the real challenge for science is um, you someone writes a paper and they say I had a theory, I ran a study, and truth revealed itself to me, and I did a single run of a statistical analysis and I'm presenting it to you. Um, but it was act, so if, if someone present writes the paper that way and that's how a lot of papers are written right because as you said we we like our own theories but it turns out it was the 937th run of that data that you did and you couldn't get the significant coefficient on the first 936, then it's a pretty big misrepresentation in the paper. And when that happens in aggregate in a discipline, it, it, it not only affects the meaning of that paper, it affects the meaning of a scientific consensus. So if I want to, if I'll throw a nightmare scenario at you and I don't know that this is true, you know, what if p-hacking and publication bias is, is kind of a big deal in, in the study of climate change, right? Uh, the cultural authority of climate change research right now is, is based on the idea that there's a scientific consensus uh, that human activity leads to certain effects. Now, I, you know, I happen to believe that that, that, that theory is, is well regarded, but what I actually don't know if there's publication bias or not. If there is, and if at some point people figure it out, like that would be catastrophic for a, a number of efforts. I mean, it, it, in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think it is a problem when you don't reveal it. Like I have no trouble with, you know, exploratory research and, and, and I have no trouble with, you know, saying I ran nine, 936 uh, regressions and I could only get this relationship in one, but there's a really good reason to pay attention to this one because it has a property that we want to think about. There's like, that would be great. That'd be really good to know. It gets problematic when the revelation doesn't occur. Um, so that's, oh, and, and then the question of what we can do, um, there are a lot of things uh, that, that people are doing led by the social sciences, right? Um, one is um, uh, I like making code books public. I like making do files public. Uh, I like making, making data management plans public where it's ethically responsible to do so. Um, I like replication studies where it's cost effective to do so. Um, I like the badge system. Uh, and just to disclose, I used to be chair of the Center for Open Science. The Center for Open Science works with a lot of different um, uh, journals to have a badge system. And if you, you know, make your data available and, and things like that, uh, you get a badge next to your publication and, and people like those. Uh, so shifting the incentive system uh, to make it so that null results and sharing your data are things you get credit for, I think are ways to mitigate uh, the incentive to only publish positive results. Okay. Um, what are some of the best strategies for social scientists to combat the, the great amount of misinformation that is going on in our society? Yeah. That's a big, uh, that's a big one. <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, the one thing I'll say, and, and uh, our friend Brendan Nyan, uh, who's, who's been at CPS now at Dartmouth, uh, I mean, work like his shows, like the one thing you do not want to do is repeat it, right? If I, I'll just give you an example. I'm going to ask a question. Is there a chicken in my pocket? All right. So just Think about that for a second. It's a ridiculous question, but now you're thinking about it, right? And by the fact that I raised the question of a chicken in my pocket, you can imagine like what a chicken in my pocket might look like and is it moving around? And, and so you're thinking about it. The mere fact that I, I said a sentence with chicken in my pocket makes you think about it. When in the process of trying to counter misinformation, you repeat it, you're making it worse, all right? So that's, Brendan has that finding, a lot of other people have that finding. So that'd be step one. The other thing really comes down, I, I think, to the communication strategy that we talked about before. Um, if you uh, talk down to people who believe misinformation, uh, you're dead in the water. You're, you know, that, that they will feel threatened by you. And even if everything else you say is correct, they're probably gonna shut you out. I like if, to find ways to understand why a person would be looking for the information that I wanna give them or why they might be in a room with me or why they might be on a website and what journey are they on? What is the next step in their lives or in their, you know, what they're trying to do with their children or whatever that they want to take at that moment. And then what I have to look for is the information that both validates them 
but also gives them a bridge to the information that I want to convey, right? That's the way that we can create the co-production that ultimately gets them so interested in our story that they want to co-produce a version with us. If we talk at them or we talk down to them, people can pick that out, right? And so I think that uh, to challenge it, we really have to think about who we're trying to talk to and think more about talking with them than to them. Uh, think about what they need at that moment and giving the information in that context. Because there's just too much competition in the, in the information space. And people who do misinformation are getting a lot better at making it tasty, like candy, uh, making it visually appealing. And so we have got to up our, in my view, our communication game, staying true to our facts, staying true to our methods, but conveying it in ways that people can actually hear. And there's a lot of people working on that now. So this is a follow-up, and I'm sure it's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, some partisans today are not open to hearing alternative viewpoints or scientific findings, um, especially from so-called experts. Is there anything that can be done if they are just not open to co-producing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give an answer, I think, based in the reality that I, I know. If you try to get everyone, it's it's not a good use of your time. Um, there's just, that, that's not the information environment that we live in now. So the question is, is we have today and we have this week and we have this month and we have whoever we're working with and whoever we can bring in. And the question is, how many people can we create environment for where it is safe for them to listen to an argument that they might find initially threatening, right? Um, so if, if you walk in as the authority, again, and you talk down to them, it's, it's very hard to get an audience. And I will say, I mean, and I'm, you know, uh, um, organizations like Gallup and Pew run surveys, and we do too, uh, asking people about so many issues. And you wouldn't believe the number of issues on which 70% of self-identified liberals and 70% of self-identified conservatives agree. They're never on the news because Anderson Cooper or Hannity can't get people to argue with each other for four hours about it. To the extent that we want to talk about science and, and combat misinformation more effectively, one place you can start is with the things that already unite people, the things that they already kind of cherish and believe in, and then build the bridge to the things you want from that. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that's a way. I will say, if, if please don't be sucked in by, you know, the fact that social media rewards clicks and, and the cable news networks reward ratings. There are so many things that Americans, so many Americans agree on. There are so many wonderful and great things that people are doing and so much accurate information that's being conveyed in ways that was never conveyed before, right? That is going on right now. The misinformation is important and we need to deal with it, but we can't get sucked into the idea that that's all that's happening. What we need to do is try and find spaces where we can improve the communication, improve the accuracy of the understandings that people have. And we in social science, we're very well positioned to do this because we have great research that improves people's lives. And some people on this call actually study how to communicate it more effectively. I think you're one of them. Um, so this is a question uh, come up in several ways. One way, it, how can we change the incentive structure of academia to reward more public engagement? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the thing you shouldn't do. Um, if you say the sentence tenure and promotion committees, uh, that's not the place to start. It's just because everybody, uh, you know, and, and their parents, you know, and their great aunts are trying to influence tenure and promotion committees, right? Um, so what I do is I actually work with professional societies. I work with people who can give out aspirational prizes, okay? I mean, if you want to catch fish, you go to where the fish swim. So think about your professional societies. Um, if they gave more awards, prizes, recognition for people who were sharing their data, for people who were sharing their code, for people who were doing replications, like it might not be publications, but there are ways you can award things that then go on CVs. And, you know, we're in this, and I, CVs is a little bit crude, but, you know, there are so many young people, the job market's like terrible now, right? So I'm thinking of graduate students and people who are assistant professors and so forth to survive in academia, if that's what they want to do, they need authority markers. They need sort of, you know, organizations and people to say, no, no, this, th what they're doing is really important, even if it's not what we counted in the past. So I think the more of them that can create currencies and they can do it, 
right? It is not expensive for APSA or AEA or, you know, uh, to do this. I've watched, uh, I've watched APOR. APOR has been really good at this. I've watched uh, AERA, the, the, the education research. They've been great at this, right? The social science organizations have been in the middle and, and that would be inexpensive uh, and easy to do. Um, so, so that's a quick one. Um, again, I, I think to, to help young people, we have to do that. But can I, I just, I want to say one other thing. Um, I'm not of the mind that like, you know, we, people want to stay in academics. There's so many things that people with social science PhDs can do for the world. And if you're struggling now with a job that sucks, and I apologize on behalf of history for you. Um, but there's uh, the skills that we have are valuable to so many other, so many people. And I hope if you're sort of thinking about, you know, how to proceed in a life as a social scientist, you'll think about those because they're really amazing things that, that we can do. And there's so many organizations that need us, that need our skill set because it is still relatively scarce. Okay, this is from uh, our wonderful colleague, Pam Davis Keen uh, in ISR. Uh, I have to say, I disagree with Skip on p-hacking. Running a 10, 100 regressions and saying why the one you pick is important does not address the fact that you would that you would have found it by chance alone, correct? Correct for the 100 regressions, and then let's chat about whether it's important. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't quite understand the, the context, but really it's, it's truth in advertising, right? My thing about p-hacking is, is tell the truth about what you've done. Tell the truth about how many runs you did. Um, because if we have a, I, I read a book, it's one of the most powerful books I've read in the last couple of years called Rigor Mortis. It's written by Richard Harris of NPR. It's about the effects of p-hacking and publication in oncology and research on cancer. And you read these tragic stories where you have these literatures where there's a consensus and the consensus is if you do X, uh, the cancer will be mitigated and you have study after study. And so then people like look at this and they, you know, either the, you know, places like NIH or, or private companies spend millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars trying to put this treatment in action and they do it and it doesn't work. Like, oh, we must have screwed up the implementation. So they spend more money and more time and more trials and it doesn't work. And then somebody looks back and like, oh, wait a minute, the null results were never published. And we could have known N years ago that seven out of every 10 trials weren't going to work, but only the three that were published are the ones that we knew about. And that's really tragic. So, you know, I think truth and the, the higher principle is truth in advertising. You know, if you, whatever, you know, mechanism you want to use and Pam, your, your sounds like it's reasonable. Just tell people you did it um, so that, so that they know, so that they have context. Um, it's almost like, you know, doing a study in like one town and then going into another town and, you know, people want to, will it work here? And just being honest about what are the aspects of your design that, that you know, influence this result, saying, well, it's likely to transfer or not. I think that that truth in advertising about p-hacking is critical for that reason. Okay, I think this question refers, it says he and Stuart, so it might be you, and I'm not sure which Stuart they're talking about, recently published an analysis of what Congress wants from NSF. Are there lessons to impart to social scientists listening today? Yeah, so uh, Stuart, and Sor Stuart Soroka of CPS oh, well. and myself, I, I uh, had a paper. That Stuart, okay. Yeah, the uh, yeah one of the awesome Stuarts, uh, but our awesome Stuart um, had a paper come out in Science Advances. I don't know a couple months ago. We um, we collected everything that every member of science said about the National Science Foundation in the congressional record for a period of about twenty eight years. Member of and Congress, you mean? Member of Congress, mem you mean? Member of Congress. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you said, uh, House yeah. House or Senate. And um, Stuart is this just unbelievable wizard in terms of text analysis. And by wizard, I don't mean capable of high-end analyses. I mean capable of going all the way down into what are the assumptions we're making and what do they mean when we try and run a text analysis. And he's, he's in my view, the model of that rigor that we were talking about. So we ran this and we were finding patterns of, of words and, and, and sequences of words that led to uh, both praise of NSF and criticism of NSF, uh, both at a whole level and then down to the social sciences in particular, and even looking at political science specifically. Um, and so the, the lessons of the paper is one, there is actually broad and bipartisan support for NSF. And it's been that way you know, for the entire time of our study. 
In fact, the only time there was anything that looked like a statistically significant difference was when one party was basically in opposition, right? So you had unified government, uh, one party had no stake in the game. And as you might expect, there's a lot of political scientists on here, you become more critical. We did not do a parallel study of NIH or any other agency. So what we know is that the, bit, the gap between criticism and praise grew between the majority and minority party uh, at that time. What I don't know if it was better or worse than NIH, but the other lesson we have from that is, and that, I guess I would talk about the lesson in terms of my broader impact pack slide earlier. We love science, but what we can't assume is that members of Congress who have just so much going on, so much to do, so many people asking for support, some of them appreci appreciate the value of science inherently, but a lot of other people wanna know how do federal expenditures in science benefit the American taxpayer? Again, they don't need probabilities, they need possibility. And if we refuse to answer that question as a, as a community, we can't be surprised when it's harder for people to defend science funding in Congress. So it's really critical to stay true to the rigor, but to be able to talk about how our work links to how to improve quality of life for people. Uh, in my other job at NSF, I have opportunities to listen to and speak to members of Congress. And you know, when you link our work, the work that you're doing to their constituents and the things that they care about, there's a lot of support for you. That there, I can't tell you how many offices I've walked out of where they say, let us know how we can help you. I mean, that's, that's never gonna be on TV because it's not people yelling at each other and it's from both parties. So uh, this is, you know, the National Science Foundation is an issue where uh, there's broad bipartisan support and that's because of the work that you do. Okay, one person listening um, is frustrated by your use of the word possibility as opposed to probability and wondering if that contradicts your emphasis on rigor because it sounds squishy. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. <laughs> so the, the context here is trying to tie your research to a public benefit. So there's a distinction, you know, and it's a little bit fuzzy between basic research and applied research. And so the reason I talk about possibility is, you know, people who do applied research tend to have an easier time talking about the benefit. But people who do basic research sometimes struggle with it and sometimes think, well, I don't really have to do that. I'm just doing uh, science for the sake of science and I don't really care about applications. And that's fine for individuals. If you want places like NSF or NIH or other things to fund your work, uh, there's got to be a story about why they should fund that rather than the other things they can fund, which includes research on childhood cancer or, or COVID or things of that nature. I mean, that is a real conversation. So for my friends in, who do basic research, really fundamental, obscure stuff, you're not going to know the probabilities. I mean, you just if you're really doing fundamental research, you want to what's the probability this is going to lead to like, um, you know, an improvement in how we educate children in learning outcomes, uh, an improvement in uh, how a tax structure leads businesses to grow. If you're really doing sufficiently basic research, if you can come up with probabilities, you know, there's a whole bunch of assumptions underneath there. And I want to know what they are. Right. But I think if you want to give a more accurate assessment of what you're doing, possibility is just fine. Right. And so I, I use the word possibility so that I can include both our friends who do applied research and our friends who do basic research. I think it is a means for greater accuracy in what you're going to say about yourself. OK, uh, can you talk about the difference between communicating what you do to public funding agencies like NSF and NIH? Yeah. And the contrasting that with. Um, engaging with the private sector, including donors, but um, also corporations? Yeah, that's a really good question. So on the government side, and again, I'm, I'm not representing NSF today, so it's, that's really important. When you approach a government agency for funding, uh, one thing to realize, one thing that people can't see, I'm just going to say this, the people that I, I have worked with and work with at NSF, the people that I meet at NSF, NIH and other, they're amazing. There are so many people working so hard to improve quality of life, to do better yesterday than we did today, and to support your work. And, and you can't see them, and they're never going to be on TV, and they're not going to be on social media promoting themselves. You would not believe the, the, the skill 
and and just how dedicated people are like people you know so i just i want to put that out there so when you approach a federal agency the first thing you need to know is that these are not glamorous jobs and people are there because they they love the country and they love the science and so just know that when you're dealing with them and the reason that that matters is those two agencies because that's i guess most of the people on here are going to go to them they're, they have one fund, in turn, they have one funder, and it's the United States Congress along with the signature of the president. And so there is an accountability to the country, to taxpayers, that we're not absolved from, even though we're doing the research. So when you support a federal agency, they want the science. They want the science to be top-notch and rigorous and ethical and precise, right? But... At NSF, for example, NSF can only fund approximately one out of every five proposals that it gets. That's just, just not because that's what it wants. It's because the, the budget that it has and the number of proposals we get gives you one in five. And so in my view, uh, if you have a stronger, broader impact statement, if you know, if you can talk about the relationship between your work and the benefit it can have to the nation or the taxpayers, and if you're in other countries, you're their national science foundations are, are similar. They're, they're funded by the government. You got to be able to tell that story, even if you're doing basic research, right? You, you might be able to get funding without the story, but you're going to help that ecosystem flourish and defend itself and achieve its mission if you can do great science and talk about the impacts. So that's government. In the private sector, um, particularly like with philanthropies, um, it's 95% listening. I mean, just when you approach a philanthropy, um, A, a lot of people have been in the room before you and are going to come in after you. So the more that you know about what they are trying to do and what they want to do but can't do, and then if you can walk in and instead of asking for something for yourself, saying, you know, I love your mission and only go if you love their mission. I, I admire your mission. I see that you want to do this. I have a way to help you with your mission. Right. So if you're if you're approaching philanthropies, I think if you don't approach that way, you're Charlie Brown's mother. I mean, people will be nice to you, but you're and, and like at the end of the day, people are less likely to remember that you're there. With companies, it's a little harder um, there. You know, companies have a, have a you know, some have a public mission, but it's overridden by a you know, not overridden, but it's often dominated by a, a profit motive. And so. There are some private companies that have a social, uh, a public mission that, that actually, you know, need to generate revenues for stakeholders, uh, but also like providing a service. And again, I think the idea there is if you want them to fund your research, don't try to sell them something. Uh, try to learn enough about what they're trying to do and, you know, tap into their own awareness of what they'd like to do but can't do. And if you can serve that, you're much more likely to get an audience. Um, and I say this with love. I mean, I, I just because I, I think that everyone, you know, in the social sciences, you know, you, you choose to do this. Right. And it's it's rigorous and it's not always the, the thing that your family rewards you for. You don't walk down the street and people like, oh, you're a social scientist. That's great. They're like, what? You're, you do social studies. Right. You know, you study elections. Yeah, I know all about elections. I mean, we live that life. But the, the thing that I've been able to see with my other gig is just the amazing impact that our work collectively has and and the country needs it right and so you know approaching people as effectively as you can it really matters okay this is a sort of a diff somewhat different version of of the question although it's a it's more specific um how much so uh i think this is probably specific to maybe um well, it's probably it's probably specific to any of the social sciences, but probably especially economics and political science. Um, how much weight should one give to current events when choosing research questions to examine uh, and ask for money about? Yeah, um, I like so. I'll give the first answer to that, which is I don't know because it's a very general question. Yeah. Um, I can tell you about the National Science Foundation, which I know a couple things about. Um, if you want to do topic uh, research, you know, valid scientific research on a current event, and you can argue that this research can be of great value to the country, and you can argue that if you don't do this research, collect this data, do this inquiry right now or very soon, 
the opportunity to understand this and benefit people and science for decades to come will be lost. NSF has a mechanism called rapids, right? Rapids are, you know, they will give you a very quick review. And if, if, if it meets those criteria, they will fund you. At the beginning of the pandemic, the social and behavioral sciences at NSF got flooded with rapid reports. <laughs> Congress gave NSF extra money to do this. And I believe it's a public thing, so I'm not giving you any NSF insider information. Uh, the, the social and behavioral sciences got over a thousand proposals. Uh, there were program officers there that went through as many proposals in six weeks as they usually do in six months. And I can tell you that that director at NSF funded, I think, 240 rapid proposals in the first couple months of the pandemic. And those, but you had, it wasn't, what you couldn't do is say, hey, I have this research, I want to do this. Like you had to say, this research is critical to this issue. And if we don't collect this data right now, we won't be able to collect it again. And we won't learn how to deal with this pandemic and the next one. So I can, that's how it works at, at one federal agency that we all know about. Okay. Um, I think that is all I have right now, unless people want to pop in a quick question. Um, we're there competing is a, with dinner. We're competing with dinner. Well, so it, you can imagine that, that when we had first started the discussion of a 50th anniversary celebration, it was going to be in person. And we were going to get together and and have um, have a have a nice reception and then uh, a dinner for 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 people. Um, this is this is this has been great as it is, and we're um, we're you know we all struggle with the medium. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, I, I'm sure we, uh, I didn't cut the numbers, but I'm sure we had many participants today. The video for this presentation will be available on the Center for Political Studies website. Thanks to uh, Professor Lupia um, for, the, for, the, for what he's talked about today, the state of social science research and his own views on our possibilities. Um, I'm delighted by, by uh, all the people who sent in tributes and, and videos. Uh, again, you can, you can catch those on the CPS website. Uh, I think you'll find them uh, uh, both touching and also just just a, a fun to look at. Uh, wonderful people talking. Uh, I want to thank um, the people who put this together, like Catherine and Carl, uh, behind the scenes. And uh, Skip, it's good to see you. And it's good to see all our colleagues uh, indirectly uh, through your questions and, and so on. So all the best to everybody. Uh, and it's a great uh, thing to celebrate and to uh, at least 50 more years of the Center for Political Studies. So thanks. <laughs>